Oh, okay, and then we'll sync everything up by doing this. Nice. It's official it's around here. super official. I know, I like right? Yeah. <clears throat> and then my little intro, and then we'll start. Let's do it. We'll see what happens. Okay. Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Paterka, a licensed massage therapist in Portland, Oregon, and I am joined by Dr. Jenny Brocker with the Portland Chiropractic Group today. Jenny, thank you so much for being here. Of course. Happy to. Amazing to have you. We have quite a long history at this point. Mm -hmm. Amazing to think about. Yeah. Um, I have two kids, and I guess I would argue that you started treating the older one before he was on the outside. Yeah, you could say that yeah. in a way, I think. Yeah, sometimes I, I do go that direction <laughs> when I talk about treating pregnant women and, yeah. and then subsequently the children that result. <laughs> yeah, my, my oldest was um, Breach, and you uh, were part of the uh, attempt to turn him around, mm -hmm. which ultimately did not succeed. Yeah, he was a stubborn little guy, sadly. wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, not, not as stubborn. Any, well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> he's also just seven, so that just comes you know, with the territory. Exactly. So to begin, could you give me a little bit of your background? I know you have a long history with chiropractics, as it were, and then what led you to be wanting to be a chiropractor yourself, and then stepping not just as a chiropractor, but a pediatric chiropractor, which is really interesting. Yeah, so um, I was a really fortunate child um, in that my mom was a chiropractor, and um, I got to grow up understanding what chiropractic is and, and the care that it provides, and um, I was also one of those kids who didn't really know how good she had it as a kid. Um, mm. I really um, didn't understand the value of what my mom did for us as kids until I went to college and didn't have it anymore. <laughs> ah, that's so funny. Um. I was, I'm always telling Ender, who loves being on the table, I'm like, you know that most kids don't get massages, right? right? right. Which we're going to talk about that later. But yeah. he's like, he's like, what do you mean? Yeah, right. <laughs> just, which is such a funny, like normal for these kids and, and something that I really like hope that they take forward in their lives as something really valuable. But um, I decided actually that I wanted to be a doctor when I was like nine or 10 years old. Wow. Um, I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to work with kids from that time. That never changed. Um, the type of doctor I wanted to be changed, uh -huh. um, as I, like, as I said, um, when I was a kid, I wanted to just be a doctor. Um, and to me, that meant that you were going to go to medical school and, and be, you know, in a hospital system and work with kids. And I didn't really understand the value of, like I said, what my mom did for us as kids mm -hmm. until I went to college and didn't have it anymore. Right. And then I really started to see like, oh, no, this actually is hugely valuable, not just for me, um, but for everyone. And I really started to look at my childhood a little bit differently, uh -huh. <laughs> started to value um, a lot of what I was able to have as a child with good health and um, and good nutrition and, you know, just learning about how to take care of myself um, that I really, like I said, valued as a college student <laughs> in yeah. a dorm trying to to make ends meet um, and go to class and, and so forth. And uh, what really hit home for me um, and what really made me change my focus um, was my junior year of college, my mom celebrated 20 years in practice. Okay. And we had a big celebration for her and I went back for it, back to my hometown. And um, my dad had put together a book that her patients had written in for years about just, you know, what they thought about the care that she provided and who she was. And it was reading a lot of those things that really like, that was oh. what I wanted out of being a doctor. That's it amazing. was, you know, people saying, you know, I was able to get back in my garden because of your care. I was able mm -hmm. to, you know, walk again because, you know, I couldn't walk without pain before, or, you know, just all of those little things that we take for granted in our lives as, you know, things that, that aren't necessities, but really they are necessities. And I was seeing my mom's care through a totally different lens through these people um, who are really, like their quality of life was really changed by this care. 
um, that she was able to provide for them. And I was like, that is what I wanted. That's yes. everything yeah. that I want to give um, to kids. And so I went to chiropractic school after that. You know, I immediately went back to school and was like, okay, medical school's out, chiropractic school's in. Um, I didn't change my undergrad degree because it was still biology, so that's okay. fine. Um, <laughs> I, it was still doctor school, so yeah, that was yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, but I you know, applied to, to chiropractic school, and I went to chiropractic school knowing I was going to work with kids. That was okay. all I ever wanted to be, okay. was a pediatric When you doctor. were going through school, was there already an option to continue and specialize or is that more um, of a recent development? It, there was an okay. option to specialize. Um, it was fairly new at that time. I think the program that I went through started in the late nineties. Um, and I graduated from high school in 2000 from college in 2004 and from Palmer in 2007, okay. chiropractic school in 2007. So, you know, it had been around for like 10 years at that yeah. point. Um, so it was still fairly new in the, in the world of education. But, but you finished chiropractic school and then did pediatric specialize. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did my board specialty. Oh, okay, that. cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's wow. Yeah. What a journey. <laughs> yeah. But you didn't, you didn't take a break. You didn't practice as a chiropractor. You went straight I onto went, your yeah, specializing. Basically. So, um, I graduated in 2007 and I'm from the Midwest. Okay. I grew up in Illinois. I um, nice. went to chiropractic school, went to college and chiropractic school in the Midwest. Neighbors from um, Ohio. Yep. So mm -hmm. I lived in Illinois my whole life and then <laughs> Iowa for a brief period. And then, um, I uh, married a man who wanted to live in Oregon, so I okay. found myself in Oregon, um, briefly lived in Eugene and had a um, very small independent contractor practice, um, uh, but it wasn't what I wanted. You know, right. it wasn't pediatric. It wasn't, I didn't um, have a mentor there that I really thought I could learn from. Mm -hmm. And so um, the timing just was incredibly fortunate that I uh, was looking for a new job um, when Dr. Elise Hewitt was advertising for an associate. Oh, wow. Um, and interviewed with her. She hired me. Um, she's been specialized in pediatric practice for like 20 years. And, oh, great. Um, you know, she basically was like, I'll teach you everything I know. It's like, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's my ideal situation. <laughs> um, so I started with her um, in 2008, and I had my son in 2009, February 2009, after I already had my oldest daughter in 2007 when I graduated from school. Um, <laughs> my son was born in 2009. Actually, he turns 11 in a couple weeks. Oh, wow. Um, and then I started my diplomate or my postgrad education in pediatrics later that year. So he okay. was seven months old when I started my okay. postgrad. Yeah. So it was Great. very soon after practice. It yeah. was kind of the soonest I could make it as happen. As soon as you could get to <laughs> exactly. it, you're like, this is what I want to do. That's awesome. Exactly. So it just in the general population for better, well, I was going to say for better or for worse, but for me, it's for worse. People still have, there's a lot of misunderstandings about chiropractic care in general. Mm -hmm. When you layer on pediatric on top of that, <laughs> I remember when um, the boys were little, I was talking to a neighbor across the street who happened to be a, a, a physician OB. And I was like, oh, you know, we'd love to stay and play, but I got to take the boys to their chiropractor. And the reaction was just like, <laughs> why on earth would yeah. you? And I am, and that was from someone in the, the, the medical field. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is like, what do you say when people are like, not like they're not being rude about it, but they're mm -hmm. skeptical or they're curious, like what um, does pediatric chiropractic care look like? Yeah, so I think it's always a little bit funny when I tell people um, that I'm a pediatric chiropractor, and the reactions vary a lot. Mm -hmm. um, some people are like, oh, that's so cool, like, good for you. And some people are like, what? You can do that on kids? And you're uh -huh. like, yeah, you can do it on kids. <laughs> 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 um, and, you know, I think that overall, the shift in paradigm in healthcare um, is changing towards more inclusive care, um, which is including chiropractic and massage and acupuncture and, and all of these, um, you know, previously considered CAM modalities or complementary alternative mm -hmm. medicine modalities. Um, and they're starting to be a little bit more integrated into kind of the healthcare teams for people. Um, I think we still have a long way to go <laughs> with that, yeah. um, especially in pediatrics, but you know, that, that paradigm shift is happening. And I think even 10 years ago, you know, if I had said that I would have gotten that like 
what reaction a lot more often than I yeah. do even now. Um, Plus but, we're in Portland, which exactly, might be its own bubble. Exactly. Yeah. I think there definitely is a bubble in Portland, yeah. um, which is awesome. I mean, it's a really fantastic place to live and practice because of that. We have so much access um, to any kind of care you could really seek right. out. And I think that's really amazing for people to have those options. Um, we have a lot of schools here that educate people um, really well and, and so I think there's a lot more um, influence in integrative care than there is maybe in other places. Um, but mostly we just talk about like, you know, their spines work the same way. They're just smaller. Yeah. Um, and, you know, especially when I start to talk about um, the trauma that we go through to be born, right? Like birth yeah. is hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard on everybody. Um, and I think a lot of times our social perspective is how difficult it is for mom. Um, but that baby is still trying to make its way into the world. And that's a really difficult yeah. journey. And a yeah. lot of times it doesn't happen really smoothly. And so there can be a lot of resultant trauma that can affect the way that, you know, the baby's body is working right away. And sometimes it, you know, kind of stays through and, and affects the way it works later on. And so we just talk about, you know, like, like it's hard and, and that's what I'm here for. And do I think every single baby needs it? Not exactly. Mm -hmm. Do I think that everybody in some form or another needs some self-care and attention to their spine? Definitely. Yeah. You know? So for the curious and the uninitiated, maybe give, an, give a, a sense of what a session looks like for a newborn and what a session looks like for my seven-year-old. Yeah. So for a newborn, um, you know, so for everybody, we do full history and physical mm -hmm. exam. So we're looking at, you know, their entire existence to that point, what's happened to them, you know, for newborns, that's a short conversation a lot of times because they've only had one thing happen to them in their life and that's be born. Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> so everything. Yeah. You know, it's everything, yeah. you know, but it's a big thing. Yeah. It's a big thing. Um, <clears throat> so we talk a lot about, you know, what their birth experience was like and how long, you know, mom was in labor, what position she was in, what position the baby was in, um, because all of those things can point to, you know, an in utero position that maybe was a little bit more stressful in one direction or the other, um, especially if they had, you know, a hand or a foot even up by their face, oh, it can yeah. affect their present, their presenting position. Um, if they're in a breech position that mm -hmm. has a whole other host of, you know, common, you know, issues that can result in that breech positioning. Yeah. Um, torticollis is more commonly associated with breech positions, chronic hip dis or, um, congenital hip dysplasia mm -hmm. is more common in breech presentation. So just things like that, knowing, you know, how baby was in there, <clears throat> how they came out, <laughs> um, is a big part of what leads the treatment in one direction or in the other. Um, and when I say full physical exam, I talk, I'm talking about just repeating everything your pediatrician's already done or your midwife's already done um, because that redundancy is really important in yeah. newborns. You know, not always will it will it show up the first time, but it may show up the second or third time. So we check all their primitive reflexes. We check all of their um, cranial nerves, um, do a full inspection of their skin and just make sure that, you know, there's nothing that stands out as something that needs to be re-referred back to their pediatrician or that needs, you know, further care somewhere else. Um, so just kind of double checking all of those things, listening to the heart, listening to the lungs, making sure there's no extra sounds that we don't want to hear. Mm. Um, and that kind of thing, checking in their mouth, looking at their eyes, you know, just, mm. just really making sure that, you know, we're triple checking, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, everything that's happening with this child. Um, because like I said, you know, things can change really quickly in newborns. And, and so it's important to have, you know, people looking, especially if there's a concern, people looking, you know, yeah. at everything yeah. multiple times in a row <laughs> to make sure that we're not missing something. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then uh, after that, we would, as long as there's no kind of contraindications to care, there's no concerns about, you know, a presenting um, issue that, you know, would need to be referred back out, um, then we would start treatment. Yeah. Um, the treatment for newborns, we start with um, doing craniosacral therapy. Okay. Um, so we'll move through the whole craniosacral system, which I can talk about in a second. Yeah. Um, That's actually on then, the list. <laughs> nice. It says talk about craniosacral. Yeah. We're going to get there. We're going to get yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and then check through their spine and look for any spinal restrictions. Um, for anyone who's ever been to a chiropractor before, the exam part of looking for a restriction is exactly the same. What we're yeah. looking for is restrictions in the joints that are in the spine that may be affecting the way that the area around that joint 
that's not moving very well is working. So the muscles may be a little tighter in that area. Um, the nerves that are exiting from the, behind the spaces and the, the joints may be a little bit irritated and wherever that nerve is going may not function as well as it could be. Um, so we just look for any restriction that could be affecting the way the body functions. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the adjustment is the idea again behind the adjustment is the same as it is for everybody. It's to release that restriction in the joint so that your body functions the way that it needs mm-hmm. to. The spine is moving um, the way that it needs to and, and resulting irritation to that area will subside. Um, the application of the adjustment is tailored to the size of the patient. That makes sense. <laughs> um, so a lot of people, when I get that, like, oh, you can do that on babies? Like, yeah, but it looks really different yeah. than what it does on adults, right? So, you know, on, on bigger people, they would lay on a table and we would feel their backs and use a whole hand contact or something like that. Um, with babies, we just hold them in, and use like a tiny thumb contact or a tiny finger mm-hmm. contact. Um The forces are tailored to the size of the patient. The depth of the adjustment is tailored to the size of the patient. So it's really, um, it's really safe Mm -hmm. because of all that modification. Um, we're not moving through any physiological barriers. And so we're not really putting any stress on the body. We're just opening the space in the joints. Yeah. Awesome. And then kids grow, they age. They do. And then, I mean, my my boys are five and seven. Their sessions starting to look more like what I. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As kids grow, you know, their body's starting to grow, and and their spinal joints are starting to change a little bit, and their firmness and the musculature and the ligaments around that. And so, you know, once they get old enough or, and are comfortable enough to lay on the table by themselves, um, we'll lay them on the table just like they would, you know, with mom and dad. Um, and then feel their spines in the same way. The contacts change a little bit as babies, you know, grow into children. Um, but that force and the contacts and the depth are all still modified for the age of the child. Mm. So we wouldn't really start using quote unquote adult forces until we had somebody who was well into teenage Mm -hmm. and even early twenties years, Mm -hmm. um, depending on their size, you know, sometimes you'll get a football player who's 15 who maybe needs a little bit more force Mm. just to get through their muscle systems. But for the most part, that continues to be pretty tailored until they're through in the late stages of adolescence. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, we said we'd come back to it. Craniosacral, (laughs) very subtle, work. And I find fascinating. I took an intro um, level craniosacral class back at East West when I was there. And it was just one of those things where you're like, am I feeling it? Uh I think that's it. Did I make that up? And like, is it just more doing it? Like I would like to, I think I need to take another class. Maybe Carol Gray in Portland, I think is a great resource for that Mm -hmm. kind of subtle touch. But um, I don't know. What would you say like cranial looks like and yeah I mean cranial does it is really subtle and um the movements are really you know very minor but really profound Mm -hmm. and um the contacts are very light and and everything moves really slowly and really gently which makes it ideal for kids Mm -hmm. because um you know, they're able to feel something that's relaxing, it's calming, um, especially with babies. A lot of babies fall asleep during the treatments mm. um, and they lay very peacefully on the table, which yeah, is always really sweet. That's sweet. Um, but yeah, so craniosacral therapy specifically is looking at the membrane that's underneath the cranial bones. So your your skull is made of all these different bones and actually those bones never fuse together. Um, for a lot of years, we thought that it did. It actually doesn't. And mm. so there's always space between those bones, even in, until you're 90 um, and beyond. And um, so the membrane that lines that inside of the bones um, can start to get restricted. It can start to be restricted from, like I said, birth trauma, um, from big falls, from illnesses, mm. from stress. All of those things that make our body feel tight and tense can start to affect that membrane. And so as that membrane starts to get tighter, it doesn't allow as much movement in the bones and the system can slowly start to kind of slow down and become sluggish, which can affect a whole host of systems. And so, um, the craniosacral therapy is kind of an indirect method of releasing a soft tissue structure. So with massage, you're doing a lot of direct soft tissue work. You're breaking up restrictions Mm -hmm. and that takes more force. Um, the indirect methodology is sort of where instead of going into the restriction, you kind of pull the restriction the opposite direction and wait and sort of let it relax and untwist and unwind, um, 
with that hold. And so because of that, it has to be a lighter force and it has to be um, a much lighter touch and it takes a little bit longer to, to sometimes break up those restrictions. Um, and kids, kids respond really quickly to everything because their bodies are like, oh. hooray! <laughs> <laughs> they don't have all the layers of compensation and years of, you know, sitting in a, in a car and at a desk and all of those things. And so their bodies tend to respond really quickly to most care um, and they get better really quickly, which is always really fun. Um, but craniosacral therapy is another thing where kids tend to respond very quickly because they don't have a lot of layers. Um, and so we can kind of feel the layers that are there and get them relaxed and, and moving the way that they're supposed to. And then it sort of takes all that pressure and tension away. It just helps support their body's overall function. Um, I look at it as a continuation of the spine, right? The spine is housing your spinal cord, mm -hmm. which is an important part of your central nervous system. Um, but your cranium is housing the other really important part of your central <laughs> nervous system, and that's your brain. Um, and so, you know, using those, those two um, techniques together helps us really make sure that we're covering that entire central nervous system, yeah. taking away any irritation from that central space that may be causing, you know, any sort of function issue in your body. Um, I tell a lot of kids, especially as I get older, um, we call the, the craniosacral therapy, the quiet work because it doesn't mm. make any popping sounds. Right. Um, adjustments do in kids sometimes still make little popping sounds. We call them popcorns. Um, <laughs> And, and so they, you know, get the quiet work, which doesn't make any sounds. Um, and I joke it's because, you know, your head shouldn't make popping sounds. <laughs> <laughs> if it does, we did something wrong. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we talk a lot about the quiet work versus the pops and, and, and different things like that, but it really is a very subtle movement. And, and it's funny because in chiropractic, you know, we learn to really hone our skills with palpation, to find that restricted joint. It's very specific. That's what yeah. makes it so so um, profound when those adjustments work. They are very specific. Um, but this is a whole other level of refinement in your skill because, you know, you're used to feeling something, and, and this is even more subtle than that. Yeah. Um, and it's a very right-brained activity. <laughs> what would you say to someone like me who wants to de further develop that touch that level of like paying attention at that. So there's a couple level. different ways that you can, so you can feel it on yourself mm -hmm. um, and you can feel it on other people. Yeah. That sort of rhythm that you're looking for. Um, but I always find that if you have sort of closed off your other sensory input, so like close your eyes, be in a quiet space so that you're not taking in sensory input from other places and you're mm. really being able to focus on that tactile input, it'll like eventually it'll just scream at you like, It'll be so obvious. It'll be like, uh, oh, that's what I've been feeling this whole time. Uh, um, but you also have to really like trust that right side of your brain. Like take the left side that's very logical and very structured and analytical and just like, we're going to take a break. We're going <laughs> to focus on this part that's more intuitive. Yes. Um, and that's like, in my experience as a chiropractor, you know, we spent eight years in school, right? Like that's, there's a lot of analytics that yep. go into that, a lot of left-brained activity. And, and I found when I came out of school, like, oh, I really got to bring some balance back to this, oh. you know, brain activity because I felt very left-brained and, um, it takes some, some time and some practice to get that right brain to really like feel confident that, yeah. that it's feeling what it's feeling and to okay. trust that instinct. But I think I'll start doing, I think there. I'll start doing some more on, on my and kids when say, they're on the table. Feeling it on the kids is so yeah. much, like it's so much more obvious on kids because everything's more obvious on kids. Okay. It moves more robustly. Um, most of the time, because like I said, they don't have as many layers of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before I forget, so we jumped right into kids, but I, I wanted to ask you, sure what your care looks like for supporting expecting mothers and then how that, how you support them postpartum. Cause you work on, on moms throughout, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I get a lot of referrals from midwives, which is so awesome um, that we have that resource in Portland and the option to have a variety of different kinds of birth, birth centers and home births and hospital births. Um, and so there's a, a lot of um, support that can be had there. Um, I have always thought that pregnancy um, should feel good. <laughs> I mean, your body is carrying a new person and yes. that's a really big deal. Um, but it doesn't have to hurt. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think that there's kind of a social acceptance that, you know, things related to pregnancy are just 
related to pregnancy and too bad that's life. It's just meant um, to be uncomfortable it, and get yeah. used to it. And yeah. I disagree. <laughs> Good. Um, I had three kids sure. and none of my pregnancies were particularly uncomfortable. And I think, you know, I owe a lot of that to the care that I received. I got regular adjustments. I got massage when I was pregnant. Um, and you know, I, I think it really helped me carry my kids in a way mm. that was, you know, comfortable and easy. And I had great pregnancies. Um, and that's what I want for other people. I don't ever want people to, to be in such agony that they consider not having more kids because mm. of, you know, that pregnancy was so terrible. Right. Um, and so, you know, being able to, to help with low back pain, pubic symphysis pain, those are kind of the big ones. Um, even headaches during pregnancy, like who wants to have a headache? No one. Like that's terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, so being able to help with those things as, you know, all of those physiological changes are happening, you absolutely can still support a woman's body through that transition in pregnancy. Um, those techniques, again, are modified a little bit um, based on, you know, each individual person and how their body is responding to those hormones that are meant to cause everything to sort of relax Mm -hmm. and, and, and not. And where they are in the nine months. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, some people I see from, you know, very early in pregnancy, three, four months. Um, some people I don't see till the very end. Um, and that's kind of whatever their experience is, whoever referred them, you know, whatever problem they're having. So, you know, it's wherever they are and we just kind of follow them through yeah. wherever they're going. And then they, and then after the birth, you say, well, like, what, what was that experience like? And then you assess like what they might need afterwards. Yeah. So yeah. I always tell, um, tell mom. So the first thing is that I have a pillow that I lay on the table mm-hmm. that allows for moms to lay face down. It's got a space for baby to, to lay um, that creates a cradle so that they can lay on their tummy yes. and get treated. So that part of it um, is really different. It's like a whole special pillow it system. It is. A yeah. Very, yeah, it's it's a really um, complicated Velcroed system of <laughs> pillows. Very um, technological. <laughs> it's very, yeah, it's exactly. Um, but that allows for me to assess their spine when it's in a neutral position, which mm. um, if you don't have a pregnancy pillow or you know a way on a table to make space for the baby, um, it changes. It changes that neutral spine position. You know, if you're checking somebody on their side, it's not as effective as when you're checking them face down. Mm. Um, and so I check everybody face down um, and kind of find where where their restrictions are. Similarly, um, but the adjustments are very specific to not go through that physiological barrier in the ligaments. So Mm -hmm. we've got now stretchier ligaments that are not supporting the joints as much as they maybe would have um, if they weren't full of relaxin and causing them to stretch out. Um, And so it's really important when you're treating pregnancy to not go through that physiological barrier um, because that's where you start to injure joints and that's not ideal situation. Um, And so just being really cautious about the number of regions that I adjust and how I'm adjusting them to make sure that we're not, you know, causing more discomfort than, um, improvement. Right. Basically. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then I also do check the ligaments that are supporting the uterus, make sure that there's nothing, you know, too tight on one side or the other, the round ligaments, that's kind of a, a big trigger word for pregnancy. Cause there can be certainly round ligament pain that mm-hmm. is very uncomfortable. Um, but it doesn't have to be because it's a really simple release <laughs> to help kind of take the spasm out of that ligament and allow for things to relax through there. So, <clears throat> that's something I can check also. And just, oh. you know, again, like it's all about comfort and making that pregnancy the best experience it can be. Um, because it's already hard work. <laughs> it doesn't have to be painful too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then after, After babies are born, um, after you go through labor and delivery, you know, depending on how that labor and delivery ended up for you, um, you know, there could be a whole host of new things, right? Um, There could be positions that you were in that you didn't even think about that were causing upper back pain or, you know... um, you laid in a bed for three days and that caused neck pain or, you know, Mm -hmm. something like that. So, you know, I always tell people like pregnancy or delivery is like getting hit by a truck. Like everything hurts and that's okay. It's supposed to like every muscle is going to feel like it's on fire and that's okay. Okay. (laughs) Um, that's part of it and that's going to get better and that's okay. That's part of just the recovery of, of a normal delivery. Um, but if there's anything sharp, if there's anything that's, 
that's mentally distracting you from your ability to take care of your new baby or to take care of yourself, those are the kinds of things that we can get to right away and take them out of the way. You know, if there's, you know, some kink in your neck, if you've got a new headache, um, if you've got something going on in your mid back, that's making it hard to hold your baby in a breastfeeding position. Um, those are the kinds of things we can get to right away and, and get them out of the way so that your recovery is smoother and your care for your baby is easier. Um, barring any of that, if you just feel like you got hit by a truck, <laughs> give it a few weeks, <laughs> yeah. get used to being a parent. Um, that's a huge transition. Especially if it's number one. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's a huge transition all by itself. Um, and then I usually check people somewhere in that, like, you know, four to five weeks, four to six weeks after their delivery, um, just to kind of see how things are coming back together, see how their body's moving, mm -hmm. see how breastfeeding's going for them. Um, we talk about baby care um, and whether or not, you know, their infant's doing well or if they need, you know, their infant maybe needs some care and support as well. So really looking at that dyad of, of mom and baby yeah. to see, you know, how can we support them to have a successful Sorry, dads, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the dads get treated on the other side of the office. That's like not my deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we They're, just bring the dads. We send them over to the other yeah, side. <laughs> They're fine. They're they don't adults. Need, they don't it's need okay. anything. <laughs> <laughs> they can deal. Okay, so well, wow, that's that's uh, a lot of great information. Thank you so much. So um, these are some some things I like to ask, uh, particularly body workers and people in the healthcare field that come on. But as a um, as a big topic, not not getting specific to you, although we can get specific to you. How do you think about self care? We're trying part of the conversation. Of this podcast is trying to like take back the hashtag self-care and like, let's talk about more mm -hmm. realistic ways to take care of ourselves. And how do you think about that term and when it comes up? I think so much of self-care, self-care has to do with mental and emotional care. Yeah. Um, I think that in this day and age, we move so quickly um, mentally and we move so quickly physically that I think it's easy to get really disconnected to how we actually feel. Um, how we feel emotionally, how we feel in our bodies. Um, and that disconnection, I think, can be really hard for people. Yeah. Um, I think it's really easy to get burned out that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think any sort of self-care, the first step in self-care is, you know, recognizing that emotional and mental peace, you know, slowing down enough to know that you need to do something that takes your mind away from the, the hectic, busy life mm -hmm. that you have. And whatever that looks like for any individual person is really different, I think. Yeah, it might um, be meditation. Yeah. It might be a, a therapist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It might be, you know, yeah, exactly. Seeing a therapist, it might be meditation. It might be planning a pedicure once a month. Oh. You know, it might be, you know, as simple as just like sitting in a quiet room reading a book, right? Like just anything that... Um, that allows somebody to like take a step back, a deep breath and really connect with how they're feeling, like their person is feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, and then fill that up in whatever way feels the best for them. Um, and sometimes that's coming to see me once a week. Sometimes that's coming for a massage once a month, you know, it's whatever it is that really for each individual person, I think it looks really different. Um, and I think the problem is that, um, a lot of times we try to pigeonhole what self-care looks like yeah, and that can be really daunting yeah. to a lot of people. Well, and there's a lot of self-care being sold to us constantly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think it's really about like connecting with yourself and realizing like, okay, I need some decompression from like whatever situation I'm in. I'm going to like go sit in a bathtub for however long and like relax or, you know, I'm going to go for a walk or, yeah. you know, I'm going to go to the gym if that's your thing. Right. Um, it's whatever allows us to take those, those moments to really connect with ourselves and, and figure out what we need to feel whole and feel energized to face whatever we're facing yeah. <laughs> in our lives. Um, because otherwise I think we just get burned out and yeah. I think then, you know, we're not supporting ourselves and that means we're not supporting the people around us and, and that can be really challenging. Yeah. Those are, wow, those are really great thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to be able to like, uh, ass I, every, I've asked, I think every, nearly every guest on here about self-care. So I think over time it's going to become this really interesting resource. Yeah. I mean, I, I should start compiling them. That's a, yeah, that's a um, idea. Another, another thing I like to ask about, what would you say to maybe other chiropractors, but you could speak to other body workers in general. 
about longevity. In, in massage therapy, there's a lot of burnout. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that a lot of it comes um, energetically and emotionally before physically. Mm -hmm. Like your psyche is going to break before your thumbs. Mm -hmm. in, and that's just a feeling I have. But um, how do you think about longevity? What, what can people do to protect their career so they can still keep taking care of people? I think it really comes down to like constantly remembering in whatever way works for you, why you got into this business. Mm. Um, you know, for me, it stems back to that nine or 10 year old child who, um, read a book about a girl who wasn't cared for by their doctor. And that really struck me as like, I never want that to happen to anyone. I'm going to take care of every child because mm. they deserve it. Right. Um, and so like having those, those moments where you really connect back to like, why was I doing this? Um, and it sort of re-inspires you, I think, you know, to think about where you started and where you came and why, like, what's your why for, for yeah. what you're doing? Um, and really reconnecting with that, I think helps a lot whenever you're starting to feel a little burned out. I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, as a person who works on people, I think there's a lot of transfer of energy that we don't necessarily protect, like you said. Yeah. Um, I think we are we tend to be very giving people, and that's giving of our time, and that's giving of our energy, and that's giving of our talents. And sometimes we don't take enough time to step back and like maybe take something. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, and we have a lot of conversations around that in our office, actually, a lot of the doctors, um, you know, are spending so much time treating that we're not, you know, getting massage regularly mm -hmm. like we should, you know? And so, you know, we have a lot of those conversations just within our own office saying like, okay, we need to, we need to really balance this out. Like, you know, our massage therapists get adjusted, you know, we need to try to get massage. We need to try to, you know, explore whatever like I said, self-care avenues, that means. Um, so in that perspective, I think there needs to be a balance between the give and take <laughs> that we are as providers. Um, and I think most providers tend to skew way towards the give <laughs> and yeah. less so for the take. Yeah. And I think that causes a lot of burnout. I think okay. that means that we forget a lot of, you know, why we got into this and it just becomes that, you know, mundane everyday thing that you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, we really forget about, you know, what made us want to be who we are and, and also like the people that we get to serve. Like yeah. I love going to work every day because I get to see kids. I get to see babies grow mm. every day. Right. I've been at my practice now for, um, 11 and a half years. And, you know, some of the first patients I had are in fifth grade, you know, and that's wow. so cool to see how they've grown and changed over the years. And, and some of those patients are now in college and they're coming back and, and to see, you know, where they're headed in their lives. And I had a patient who I started treating uh, late in high school and she left for college uh, this past year. And I just saw her over the Christmas break. She's like, I couldn't wait to get back here. I told my mom to schedule an appointment as soon as I got back, you know, oh, and, that's awesome. and that kind of stuff is really like, that's what fills you up. Right. That's mm -hmm. what's like, and you have to have those moments. You have to reconnect with that. I think otherwise it is easy to get burned out yeah. um, emotion emotionally. Um, but I think we also need to, to pay really close attention to how we stand and sit and, yes. and use our bodies yes. and our work. All um, of that to say, like, physically, you still yes. need those body yes. mechanics in place. Yes. Yeah. I t think um, the tendency is to overfocus on that. Uh -huh. Like, that's where people think they're going to burn out first. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good, yeah. good reminder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I certainly need that reminder. I know I spoke to uh, Dr. William Plow on this podcast. He's like, every moment, don't like, don't think like, oh, I'll fix my body mechanics later, but I'm just going to muscle through it this time. He's like, nope, stop what you're doing. Oh. <laughs> Reset yourself. Like you're not serving yourself or your client. If you, you know, like, yeah, every, like exactly. massage through like med sort of a meditative practice and yeah. constantly like. Yeah, we talk about that. So I, Dr. Elise and I have had the, the fortune of getting to teach pediatric chiropractic care um, in two chiropractors in Mexico over the past oh, wow. couple of years, which has been really exciting and super rewarding. Um, and, you know, that's something we always talk about with them when we get down there is like, no, look how you're standing. Like if you hunch over a baby like that, you know, eight patients a day, every day, like your body's going to fall apart and you, know, you have to be really conscious of how you're standing and how you're, you know, they're smaller people. So you're going to have to reach down, you know, and, and how do you do that in a way that protects your own spinal mechanics, mm -hmm. um, is something we, we definitely talk about when we go down there, yeah, which is always really interesting. Okay. 
self-care, longevity, great thoughts. Thank you so much. Okay, so my last thing that I'm very curious about is um, providing more care, massage therapy, mm -hmm. to youth and adolescents. My seven-year-old loves being on the table. Mm -hmm. He insists on being on the table every week. And the five-year-old, a little squirmy. <laughs> hard, for him, hard, hard for him to sit still quite. And then um, obviously hearing your story growing up, mm -hmm. how much you benefited from that care. I'm sure mm -hmm. your kids get adjusted regularly. They do. Are they excited mm -hmm. about it? Uh, two of them are very excited about okay. it. One of them less so. Okay. Um, she recognizes that it's good for her, but she doesn't love it <laughs> the, okay. other, the way the other two do. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other two ask me all the time, especially my oldest, um, as she's been more involved in sports, you know, if she has, you know, even a slight fall or injury, you know, she'll come home and like, my hip is hurting. Is that okay? Like, can you <laughs> check it? You know? And it's like, yeah, absolutely. Let's see what's going on. You know? And you'd be like, and uh, you need to make so... an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> So sometimes we check things on the couch. In, yeah, why not? At, in, right so, before bed. And then just last night, I was at a first Thursday event doing chair massage. Three solid hours. It was, it was awesome. Nice. And uh, there was a family that showed up with uh, three young kids. And at one point, the girl, she must have been about eight or nine. She came up and she was like, do you think I could do that? And I was like, yeah, bring your mom or dad over. They have to sign this. But yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Like, and then she... Get, she, her back was hurting and she got on the chair and she loved it. And yeah. I was like, there's, I just feel like youth and adolescents mm -hmm. are being underserved. Like mom and dad will, you know, talk all day long about how good massage is and how yeah. it's like something they like to do. They get regularly, but they don't think about it for their kids. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not easy. Your body's growing and changing things hurt. And totally. like, and then you have the whole like, you have athletes or just, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in dance, you have really active kids doing a lot of things. So totally. how would you recommend I think about serving youth and adolescents? I mean, there's the obvious piece that like an adult needs to be present the mm -hmm. whole time. That's mm -hmm. that piece. But like how to maybe get through to them or how could I talk about it? I would like to start seeing some young people on the table. Um, I think one of the common misconceptions societally for us is that um, kids are super flexible and they bounce, right? You hear that all the time. Like, oh, you know, they didn't break anything when they fell down the stairs because kids bounce, right? Yeah. Um, and that's like true a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> but not true like as much as I think we would like to think. Um, you know, their bodies are put together differently. They have, you know, stretchier joints that have, you know, looser ligaments and that allows for a lot more space to be filled up before kids express pain and discomfort. And I think that's sort of what triggers us as adults is that like, I have pain somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to get that treated. Um, but kids don't complain of pain in the mm. same way that adults do. I think for a couple of reasons, I think one, because of the way their bodies are put together, they do have stretchier ligaments. They do have, you know, more mobility. And so it takes longer for those spaces to fill up and, and actually cause discomfort. But I also think that, um, kids don't always recognize pain in the same way that we do mm -hmm. as adults. You know, we have like something that's stuck somewhere and a muscle that's tight and it's like, ow, right? We think, ow, right. that hurts. Um, but kids don't always make that connection, um, especially young kids. And so we talk a lot about um, when we're doing our histories and, and our daily appointments um, with kids, talking about their attitude, their appetite, their sleep, and their bowel habits. Um, those are the quality of life concerns that tend to affect kids if there's something going on in their body. And so I would say that, you know, approaching it from that direction, you know, looking at, you know, what kind of quality of life things are you seeing with your child that may be helped by, you know, doing some massage or some, you know, something that's more calming. I think kids who, um, who have body work tend to have like a little bit more calm and awareness yeah. in their bodies. Um, and so, you know, being able to bring some of that balance to their system. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking like, what a gift to like my seven year old It's normal. Like he mm -hmm. was like, he's like in for life now. Yeah, totally. He'll get massages his whole life. I didn't have massages until I was an adult. Mm -hmm. So what a gift to give your kids to be like, this is a tool to take care of yourself. Let's, yeah. let's learn how this feels now so that as you, as you get older, you remember that this is an option for you. Totally. And that's something that I 
um, that, that really is so rewarding about working with kids. Um, the day that a child comes in and says, I told my parent to make this appointment because such and such reason, um, they felt something that was not the way they wanted it to feel in their body and they knew where to come to get it checked out. And, and that's something that I feel like is such a, like you said, a gift that we can teach kids is, you know, about how their body works, about how it should feel and about where to go when it doesn't feel the way you think it should. Um, I had a little boy once, um, who I hadn't seen for many, many months and he came in and, you know, he couldn't even articulate what didn't feel good, but he said, I just don't feel like myself. Oh, wow. And that was so profound to me. Like mm-hmm. he couldn't even say this hurts. Or like I said, you know, th- there wasn't any pain anywhere. He just kept telling his mom, I don't feel like myself. And she finally, you know, like had exhausted some other options and said, you know, maybe we should try this. Um, and after a couple of visits, you know, that was the first thing I asked him, you know, three or four visits down the road, you know, how do you feel? He's like, I totally feel like myself again, you know, oh, and it's that's like, beautiful. that's amazing. Yeah. You know? And, and he's a little kid who's going to grow with that and take that forward into his adult life. And I think we're going to see a really big shift in the way that seek, people seek healthcare in the future because we're laying a better foundation for, you know, what is out there. We're teaching kids younger and younger um, how their body should feel and what they can do about it with acupuncture and massage and chiropractic and naturopathic care and, you know, and medical care. I think it, it all dovetails together to really present like, this is how you be a whole person. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think we're teaching kids more and more that that's what a whole person looks like as they grow. Um, I think, like I said, there is a bubble for that in Portland. Yes, a little bit. (laughs) Which I feel really grateful to be a part of. It's really nice. It's nice to be inside the bubble (laughs) sometimes. Yes, it is. Um, But I think that's where it starts, and I think eventually the bubble expands, you know, to reach other places. What do you think, like, from my end as a massage therapist, Mm -hmm. what should my session look like? What should my offering be? Should it be shortened like it should be 30 to 40 45 minutes maybe table yeah, or less or definitely i guess definitely in the neighborhood of like depending on how old the child is like anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes is a good place to start okay um because kids don't tend to lay still that long yep <laughs> especially little kids yeah <laughs> um and just being really f- and and also you know there's definitely their muscles are smaller mm-hmm. <laughs> and don't tend to have as many you know hard problems to deal with. They're not as complex. Um, and so I think you can make a big change really quickly. So you've got sort of that, like we're, we're going fast, not because we have to go fast, but because we can go fast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and that's going to help the child be a little bit more cooperative. Um, and I think the other thing is like, especially the younger the kids are, um, the more flexible you have to be like they're, they may not lay on their own on the table, but you know, maybe they're sitting with mom or they're laying on top of a parent or, um, you know, that's what we do with that sort of middle toddler age child. If they're, if they're too big to, um, kind of sit on my lap and, and do an adjustment, but they're not comfortable laying on the table by themselves. We just lay them right on top of their parent. Um, and, and we can do all the work there and <clears throat> using the parents as a resource in that way, I think is always really easy and nice. Their parent is obviously familiar with them. Yeah. That makes it really easy. Mm-hmm. They trust their parent. Um, and so, you know, having just, you know, a baby or a, a toddler, if that's who you're working on sitting, um, with their legs kind of wrapped around and you can kind of work through, you know, their body system Mm -hmm. from the back without them having to be laying down or, or sitting or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then maybe once you get to like middle school, (laughs) high school athletes, for example, like they might just be getting normal looking sessions. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really tailored to, you know, and, and I find that, you know, there are a lot of days where, you know, I sit on the floor and do treatments mm. and, you know, we're playing with toys and that's fine because I got all the work done and they were playing with a toy and totally cooperative. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes that's just, you do, you really have to work at the speed of the child. And that's yeah. kind of the thing that I think, um, gets overlooked a lot in pediatric care. We really want the child to accommodate to our situation. And like, that's not going to happen. No, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> like that's just going to make everybody really frustrated. Yeah. Like you really have to work at their speed and with their cooperation because that's how you get the best results. Yeah. Um, and that's how they trust you and, and move forward with you. So that's kind of the best. <laughs> that's great. Be flexible. And- 
Flexible. Awesome. Well, thank you so much yeah, for having this conversation. Totally. How would one best get in touch with you, learn about what you do? Where's the best places? Yeah. So our clinic has a website, um, www.portlandchiropracticgroup.com. Uh, there's a lot of resources there about chiropractic, um, kind of a question and answer about pediatric chiropractic, kind of most commonly asked questions. Okay. So, um, there's a great resource there for, for people who are interested in especially pediatric care more so. Um, but we do have, so I, I've talked a lot about the pediatric side of my office, yes. but, um, we do have four chiropractors who are in general practice who oh, treat great. all the rest of the people in the family, yeah, those dads, <laughs> um, the yeah. dads, especially. <laughs> yep. And when kids choose to, to step into adulthood, they sometimes will step over to the other side okay. of the office. And yep. so it's really great to provide that continuity of care and also, um, that family of care. We have kids who, you know, I have my chiropractor and mom has her chiropractor and dad has his chiropractor. Yeah. And, and sometimes those are all different people. And that's, what's really fun about working in the group that I work with. Um, we do have, I think five or six, maybe now massage therapists in our office as well, which is awesome. That's great. Um, and so we just, we have the ability to treat everyone in the family, um, with whatever's going on for them. Um, and there's some information about some of the other doctors that are in the office on the website as well. Um, the office is located at 2031 East Burnside street. So yes, just indeed. across the river a little ways. Um, and the office phone number is 503-224-2100. There we go. Perfect. Definitely be able to find you. What about social? Um, we do have a social media page. I'm going to be really honest. It I will link to it. That's okay. Super often yeah. because we're all too busy. Yeah. It's hard to <laughs> keep is, up with this stuff. Which is, yeah. you know, not a bad problem to have, but yeah. uh, there is one and that does have more information okay, about the great. office and the website and all that good stuff. Dr. Jenny Brocker with the Portland Chiropractic Group. <laughs> thanks so much for being on the Massage Hodge podcast. And to the audience, thanks for listening. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or using your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.